Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you back uh, on behalf of the Russell Sage Foundation, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and Duke University. We're back at the Summer Institute in Computational Social Science, and hello again to everyone on the live stream. So earlier this morning, um, <clears throat> we talked some about experiments, uh, what they are, uh, why they're helpful, and then we talked a little bit about some ideas we can use when designing our experiments that will potentially make them more interesting and more important. Now what I want to talk a little bit is about the different ways that I see people actually doing experiments and making them happen. So many of you, I hope, after seeing this stuff this morning, we're thinking, great, I have this cool idea. I want to do an experiment. How should I get started? Uh, and so I want to talk about the different ways I've seen people do experiments in the digital age. So to be clear, I'm going to talk about four main strategies, and, but none of them are perfect. So I think sometimes people think, oh, if I could just partner with Facebook, I could do the perfect experiment. And I think that's generally not the case. Um, that many of these things involve trade-offs. So I think I'm going to talk about four main trade-offs. I want to define each of these terms. So first is cost. And so cost, this includes the cost that you have to pay to participants. It also includes the cost in your time uh, and the cost in terms of getting everything set up. So money and time. Uh, control, meaning the amount that you can use the treatments that you want you can measure the outcomes that you want. You can control who or who is not the participant. Uh, realism is sort of the extent to which the experiment is measuring the effect of some more or less naturally occurring treatment on some uh, more or less naturally occurring behavior. And ethics is ethics. OK, so the first main strategy is what I like to call partnering with the powerful. So this would be uh, trying to partner with a company. It could also be an NGO, a government, a political campaign. So in all of these things, these are people or organizations who are out in the world trying to do stuff. And they often are already running experiments or could potentially benefit from running experiments. And so if you can partner with them, you can potentially do the experiment that you want. Uh, generally, these have low costs in the sense that the partner often bears a lot of the cost. But these are not free for you, because there is often a large cost in you forming this partnership, making sure the partnership works successfully. Often the partnerships don't work successfully, so there's a lot of um, false starts as well in this. Uh, control is medium. Certain times the, the partner will allow you to you can often do lots of things, but the limitation the control often comes from the constraint that the partner imposes. So for example, if you partner with Facebook, there are certain experiments they will just not let you run, like, and because that's contrary to their business interests. Uh, realism is often high, because these are real people who are doing, trying to get things done in the world. And the ethics are potentially complex. So we talk some about what happens if the partner has a goal that you don't share. There are often issues that arise as well about intervening in real systems. And so this is not always problematic, but it can be complicated. Uh, one question that I get asked a lot is, how should I do this? Like, I really want to partner with someone. How should I go about doing it? We had a really nice uh, discussion about it at lunch uh, one day. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about other strategies that I've seen. Um, so the first is, this is explicitly called partner, it is not called, I want people to give me their data. And so I've often heard people come and say to me, I want someone to give me their data. And I'm like, that's not going to work. I can just tell you right now, if that is how you're approaching this, it's not going to work. So think about it as a partnership. And Sanaz has a lot of great ideas about how to make it a partnership. So you should talk to her about this as well at lunch or dinner. Um, start with personal relationships. Uh, you are, uh, the way I like to think about it is the person that you are asking for help is more busy than you. That should be your assumption. It should be, you should assume that if you're a graduate student, you should assume the person you're asking for help is more busy than your advisor. Um, so they just are. And so like, I remember one time I had this idea I thought, oh, uh, this is a huge company. 
surely they have an extra engineer who can spend a month working on my project. Uh, <laughs> And so this is obviously a very silly idea. Uh, no matter how many engineers this company has, they are all 100% busy, or maybe 150% busy. And this is sort of a, the natural state of the world that these companies, if there are engineers sitting around not doing anything, those engineers will no longer be employed at that company. Or they will be assigned onto other things. Let's make it more positive. They'll be assigned to start doing stuff, because every company has more stuff they need to do than they have time for. So you should assume for sure that everyone is completely overloaded and you're asking them to overload on top of an overload. Um, one strategy that I've seen that's effective, especially for graduate students, is to do internships. So <clears throat> companies often would like to hire you uh, permanently and they view internships as one way to potentially hire you, at least in the short term. So a number of you, I think, have done internships at companies or at governments, and so this would be a good thing that we could talk about in one of the meal conversations. Uh, and then these internships are really good for understanding what is and is not possible um, and starting off some of those personal relationships. Because actually, one of the other things I've seen is from the outside, it is very difficult to even know what is hard and what is easy. Because the way sometimes the data is stored you know, you think, oh, I'll just go. They must have all their data in one big, well-organized database. And <laughs> then you spend some time there, and you realize, actually, no, that, that is not the case. Certain things, they are easy, and other things are hard. And sometimes from the outside, it's hard to know the difference. Uh, and then the last is about finding Pastor's quadrant. And so this is an idea that I think is very helpful. It's very related to this idea really, between optimizing experiments and understanding experiments. And it's also sort of about breaking down the distinction that many academics have between basic research and applied research. So um, the, this idea is really motivated by the work of Pasteur. And so let me just take a step back. So many people think there's basic research, and that's what professors do, and it's cool and important and beautiful. And then there's applied research, which some academics think is grimy and not worthy of our time. Uh, not, that's not what I think, but that some people believe that. Um, and I think the work of Pasteur is a great way of illustrating why this continuum does not exist. So his work about the germ theory of disease, which everyone would describe as very basic research, uh, actually came out of work he was doing at a factory that was trying to turn beet juice into alcohol. So it's an incredibly applied problem. And so what was happening is in this factory, the processes kept breaking and stuff was blowing up. And he was like, why are these things all blowing up? Maybe there's some un thing invisible uh, organisms that are causing these kinds of reactions and causing this not to work as well as I'd like. And so, is that work by Pasteur, is that applied or is that basic? It's kind of both. And so if you have a one-dimensional continuum, you can't really be at both ends of that continuum. So the Pasteur example might lead us to reconsider whether it is really a one-dimensional continuum or whether there's more than one dimension. And so uh, Stokes has proposed instead that this is really a two-dimensional process. And so the two dimensions are whether there is a quest for fundamental understanding and whether there is a consideration of use. And so Pasteur's work, there was a quest for fundamental understanding, but there was also a motivation, consideration of use. And so this is very different. A lot of, um, so generally I think as researchers, we often want to be in this row here where we are seeking fundamental understanding. Um, and some work seeks fundamental understanding with no consideration of use. So this, the example um, that uh, Stokes talks about is Bohr and understanding the structure of the atom. This was done without a consideration of use. It turns out to be very useful, um, but that was not um, what was the consideration at the time. Also, there's work that is, does not seek fundamental understanding, but is definitely motivated by use. So the example here is Edison. So Edison 
like b did a lot of stuff, built light bulbs and all this other stuff, didn't really make basic scientific advances, but made huge advances in society and enabling us to enjoy a lot of the benefits of electricity. And so the idea is that if you are partnering with the powerful, the best place to be is here. You want to be in Pastor's Quadrant. And to the extent that you want to seek fundamental understanding, and your partner is often very interested in use, and so there is a place for this in scientific research. Just because there is a consideration of use does not mean that this is not science or not research or not important or interesting. Um, so that's about Pastor's Quadrant. I would recommend keeping that in mind as you try to think about how you do these partnerings. OK, so that's one approach, is partnering with the powerful. I often think that partnering with the powerful can sometimes be more trouble than it's worth. Uh, and so the other strategy is just do it yourself. Like, don't worry about all these people. Just do it yourself. And so I think there are three kinds of designs for sort of three models for doing it yourself. The first is to just use existing systems and build your experiment on top of that. And so this is very low cost. Um, it gives you generally very little control because you're not. Um, let me give you an example of this strategy first, and then I'll come back and tell you about the trade-offs. So actually, Sendel gave you the example yesterday. Uh, this was a study about um, selling uh, iPods on an online platform, kind of like Craigslist. They don't name the exact platform, but it's something like Craigslist. Um, and so they posted these different ads, and then they varied the uh, hand that was included in the picture, whether it's a ta tattoo, whether it's a black hand or a white hand. Uh, and then they measured the effect of this on the probability that the iPad, I, uh, I, I keep saying iPod, I, iPad, but th uh, there was no iPads then, the iPod would be sold and also the effect on the price that it was sold for. And so in this case, this is a digital experiment. Um, they were able to run it with participants all over the US, which was an interesting ver geographic variability is something they analyzed in more detail in the paper um, because they were using a system like Craigslist. And this did not require any programming. Like they didn't have to do anything to do this. They basically took advantage of the digital infrastructure that existed and then put their experiment on top of it. And so here you have low cost because you, you're not trying to build Craigslist yourself. You're just using Craigslist. Um, you have relatively little control because you don't control the platform. Um, the realism is often high because you're working in an existing system. And the ethics are potentially complex, not always, but potentially complex because you're again inner, inner, you're entering into a real system. Um, and so this is a use existing system strategy. Receivo and Vanderite also use that strategy as well. So this is something you could potentially do this next week. I mean, not the whole thing, but like you can get started very quickly if you have a really nice way of attaching what you want to do on top of some infrastructure that already exists. Uh, the next strategy is to kind of build your own experiment. And this is one that uh, I built along with some colleagues, Music Lab. I'll talk more about that in the next set of slides. But this involves sort of creating your own website where people can come and download new music. This is what we did, creating our own website where people could download new music. So this is much harder in terms of cost, um, but you get much, much more control. Like we could have never embedded that experiment into an existing system because the kind of design we wanted to use, no system would have supported that design because that design doesn't make sense. And no partner would have likely allowed us to use that design because it's not a design that naturally aligns with the business interests of a partner. Uh, the realism is generally medium in the sense that often if you build your own experiment, people are coming to it and not as part of their daily life. And so you sometimes lose some of the realism that comes with naturally occurring behavior. But 
it's more of like a digital field experiment. And if you design it well, it can have kind of high realism. And the ethics of these are generally easier because you're really in control of the entire system. So you don't have to deal with a partner and you don't have to deal with intervening inside of existing systems where you could potentially do some environmental harm. So I'll talk much more about building an experiment in the next set of slides. Um, finally, you can build a product. And so this, an example of this is the Movie Lens project. So in this project, this is uh, run out of the University of Minnesota. They created a system where people could get um, non-commercial personalized movie recommendations. They were doing this a long time ago before Netflix was doing movie recommendations. And so this was like at its time, a very novel service that people legitimately wanted to use. People were like, this is useful. And so they have, I believe, hundreds of thousands of users. And this provides a um, sort of data that they can use for research. And it provides a platform on which they can do experimentation. And so this has the potential to kick off these kinds of virtuous cycles. So remember when I was talking about all our ideas, I was talking about a virtuous cycle. And so here you have a similar thing. So you do research that helps you build a better product. Building a better product helps you get more users. And then you can get this virtuous cycle. So I want to be clear, though, this is um, very expensive. It's very hard to build something <laughs> that people legitimately want to use. And that simultaneously helps you do research. So if you think about it, there are tons and tons of people in the world trying to build stuff that people want to use. And most of those fail. And then you have the added difficulty that it's also supposed to be useful for science. Um, so this is a very, very uh, difficult strategy to actually take. Um, <clears throat> the control that you get is very high because you're the boss. Uh, and the realism that you get is very high because, again, you have people doing this not because they want to be in an experiment, because they want to get movie recommendations. And the ethics, I think, again, are relatively easy because, again, you're in total control. So this is the build a product strategy. I think it's very difficult. But to me, it seems really exciting because if you can do it, which, again, I think is very difficult, you can really do stuff that would be hard to do any other way. Um, so those are the four strategies that I see. None of them are perfect, um, but I really do want to emphasize these three strategies. That is, you don't just need to, like, you don't have to work with partners. You can do it yourself. Um, and there are a lot of downsides that come from working with partners, and doing it yourself creates a lot of opportunities for more control. Um, but you also give up stuff, like the scale that you get from working with partners and sometimes the realism. So there is a trade-off, but both sides of this exist. You don't just have to work with partners. Uh, any questions? Ike? Um, I'm wondering, when you're applying an experiment on an existing website, so you utilize their services, what is your view on the potential that there is like a selection bias of users going to that website, as well as like services that claim to analyze website traffic and what type of users are going to those websites like Alexa.com? Sure. OK, it's a great question. So if you do an experiment in an existing system, then you have to think about who are the users of that system. <clears throat> And so it's true that those users may be specific. So if, if I was going to do this, I think there's sort of two ways I would think about it. One is maybe I really only care about those users. So for example, I, you had talked some about Backpage. Is that what it's called? So it, Backpage, for example, it's now out of business. But you may care about users of Backpage more than you would care about a random sample of Americans. And so in that case, the non-representative population is a feature and not a bug. I think too often we think of random, a uh, simple random sample of the entire US population as the gold standard. But it's not the gold standard for lots of questions. For lots of questions, we want the actual population of people who are using a system. Um, now, if you don't have that kind of question, I think the second way to think about it might be 
can I replicate this on multiple existing systems? So let's imagine, for example, Craigslist. Uh, you might think, well, the people who are on Craigslist are different than the people who are not on Craigslist. That may be true, I don't know. So are there other Craigslist type platforms that exist? Uh, like eBay or I don't know what are the, there are probably more. And can I replicate this experiment on multiple platforms? And again, because the cost, the variable cost is low, potentially you can replicate it on multiple platforms. And then I think that gives you a much stronger result than you would get from any single platform. I want to also talk about one complexity that comes from working on any platform and why I think multiple platform research is really good, is that sometimes the results that come from a single platform are, are, include algorithmic confounding. And so you have to decide whether you want algorithmic confounding or not. So let me give you an example. So in the Wikipedia Barnstar study, let's imagine that one of the things they measured is when you receive a barn star, do you also then get subsequently more barn stars? So if it turns out that Wikipedia ranks people by the number of barn stars they receive, then receiving a barn star might be more likely to give them another barn star, not because of any psychological reason, but because of the mechanisms at place in Wikipedia. And so lots of these online systems are ranking or prioritizing things for you. And so you have to decide whether you want those in there. So if you're particularly interested in like how Backpage works, then you probably want that in there. But if you're interested more in like psychological decision making, then you probably don't want those in there. And it's often very difficult to isolate them and figure out how those algorithmic decisions are being made by these platforms and control them. And so in that setting, doing it on multiple platforms is really helpful because it makes you more confident that it's not the result of some platform-specific algorithm. Yeah, Carson? I feel like a lot of the stuff that we as CSS people do is some one-time analysis. So we, we have some Twitter data or some social media data. We run something one time, we analyze it, that's it. But with these platforms, you actually need quite a different skill set, right? You need to be able to deploy something which runs at scale potentially and like building a product. So I, for example, would not be able to do that uh, at the moment. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your experiences with wiki survey. So how did you actually come up with this giant thing that actually works? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so a number of these strategies require skills that we don't really learn. Um, so building your own product or building your own experiment requires knowing stuff that we don't necessarily know. So we could, all of us could learn that stuff. I'm totally confident if you can learn all the stuff you've already learned, you can learn how to build a website. It's not necessarily the most efficient use of our time. So I can talk a little bit about the different models that I've used in the past. So for all our ideas, um, I have hired a number of different web developers. So the way I like to think about it, and this was something that we sort of started in the music lab, my dissertation experiment, was like there's a division between sort of getting the data into the database and then getting the data out of the database and doing stuff with it. And the, a lot of the stuff on the front end is stuff that I often have people, other people do, that I would hire. So sometimes people think, oh, let's have undergrads do that. And um, my experience has been that undergrads generally are not going to produce a professional quality product. You might be lucky and find an amazing undergrad, in which case that's great. But if you want a professional quality product, you need to work with professionals. Um, and the reason why professionalism, I think, is very important is that the standards for web design and product look and feel are incredibly high because most people interact with the most beautiful websites. So if you think about the websites we use most, they're like Google, the New York Times, Facebook. These companies have the best web designers in the world. And so that is the standard that people are used to. And so if you want to build something that looks and feels professional, you need to really work with professionals. Um, 
so the problem, a problem, is that professionals are expensive. And so this creates one of these um, high, there's like a high fixed cost to build it. Um, so I've worked with different models. So I've, sometimes I've hired professionals full time. There's this, some, one model is like the Lone Ranger model. I don't know if, so there's like some people out there who are web developers who kind of work, they're like out looking for projects, they work for a few months, and then they go surfing for a few months. And like some of these people are incredibly talented, but you have to find them when they're not surfing. And you have to hope that while they're surfing, generally they don't like dealing with bug requests and stuff while they're on their surfing time. So this is a model that's difficult. Um, another model is to hire someone full time, that you, but then you need often a lot of money at the beginning to be able to promise someone a job. You often need to have that money. You often don't have that money at the beginning of a project. A third model is working with a company. So I have a company that I've worked with for many years, Agathon Group. They're awesome. They're the people that built allourideas.org. Or they're the people that currently are working on allourideas.org. There are other people who helped build it along the way. Uh, they built the Open Review Toolkit. And so one advantage of working with a company is that they <coughs> often have people with many different talents. So they have a front end designer. They have people who can build the website. Those are generally different skills. If you're going with the Lone Ranger model, you need to find someone who has both of those skills, which is very, very, very difficult. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about working with professional developers maybe at one of the meal discussions. Um, I think it's a problem, it's a challenge, but I think if you want to be able to do professional stuff, I think it's really helpful to be able to work with professionals. Oh, is it a follow-up question or? Yeah, okay, Carson. Uh, how did you then actually get people to use wiki surveys? So uh, what's your strategy there? Yeah. Um, uh, hard work, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the same kinds of things that you normally see a company do. So I would go and talk to people. So initially, we tried to find some, um, like, well-known organizations that would use it. Um, and then we could say to other people, hey, like the New York City mayor's office is using it. And then everyone's like, oh, OK, well, uh, that sounds great. So initially, it had to be a lot of, um, one of our first projects was with Catholic Relief Services. They wanted to do one in, um, theirs was really interesting. They wanted to do one in multiple languages because they had people all over the world working in many different languages. So we had to build the multiple language support for them. I mean, that was something we wanted to build anyway, but we had this client that was doing a cool project and we wanted then. So you have to be out and talking to people. This was a risky thing for the person inside the organization. So I actually went to their office and talked about it to get everyone there comfortable with it. Um, and so basically treating these people like customers um, and doing a lot of the things you would try to imagine doing if you were starting a company. Um, now we're at the point where we have enough people who have already used it, and it's up and running, and it's stable, and we're not needing to change features a lot. And so now it's m more or less happening automatically um, without a lot of intervention by us. Um, but at the beginning, it took a lot of work. Natalie? Grant funding yeah. and research funding being used for web development kind of expenses. It seems like something that would be really unusual for a grant agency to see, at least in a grant from someone in my field. Um, so for all our ideas, the funding was from Google. And so they're like, yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, in terms of what that would look like from, let's say, NSF or NIH, um, I think Chris can talk about that. Um, limit on contractors, which buys a lot, but probably not the cost of all our ideas. I'm not sure. My, it bought a good chunk of the last app I built, but that's a, a limitation. Yeah. So not sure about NIH. Yeah, so $20,000 is not going to get you a product. Uh, but $20,000 can get you something, for sure. 
Um, but the other thing when you're working with developers, you also need to think about not just the cost of building it, but also the cost of maintaining it. And so if you have a short term experiment, then I guess maintenance is not as important. But for something like All Our Ideas, it takes a couple hours a month of maintenance to deal with you know, new versions of the open source packages that we use and occasional user questions and so on. So you, you want to have a system where you're going to be able to do maintenance um, if you're going to have something that's ongoing. On what was that Tuesday about how APIs often change? So you can imagine you build an app and then there's some change in some query field, the name of it changes, someone has to go fix that in multiple places. That it, it's typical when you work with a firm like this that you'd get some kind of estimate for um, user support, and it's something that might not be in your in your um, in your thoughts as you're planning a project. But it's important, especially if it has to go over a long time frame. It's, again, if it's a one-off thing, it might be less. Yeah. So one other thing, um, something about that, the estimates. So there's two ways of paying people, I think, or there's probably more than two, but there's two main ones. Uh, one is like you write a spec, and then you get a bid, and then they build the spec. Uh, and the second is paying by the hour. So I generally prefer to pay by the hour um, for a couple of reasons. One is I find that it's often very hard to write the spec because you often don't exactly know, especially if it's your first web development project. You almost certainly don't know what to ask for. Um, and then often the project evolves, and there's maintenance and things like this. And so if you have a system already set up paying people by the hour, then, um, then it works well. Now, you, some people say if you pay by the hour, then the person can maybe take advantage of you. But if you're worried about the person taking advantage of you, then you shouldn't be working with them anyway. <laughs> Um, so that's another issue in sort of working with contractors. Yeah? It's an ask. I wanted to ask about timetable. Can you give us a sense for how much time it took to set up like Music Lab? Yes. And how that changes the way you think about the project timetable? Yeah. Like, relative so, to data cleaning and wrangling. Yeah. So Music Lab, I'll talk about Music Lab in a second. That one took about six months to set up. Um, and that included a professional full-time developer, Peter Housel. Um, to build Music Lab today would not take six months. So the other thing is that we were doing it in 2004, and a lot of stuff was just harder then. Um, also, we didn't exactly know what we were doing as we were building it. In other words, that we were sort of designing it and building it at the same time which is not the most efficient thing. So um, it does add more time, but we didn't have to spend a ton of time trying to find a partner. <laughs> uh, so if we were going to try to like, go to iTunes or you know, convince them to do it, that might have taken a similar amount of time and might not have been successful. Other, any other questions about strategies for doing experiments? If people want to talk more about working with contractors, we can definitely throw it up on the board and talk about it.